and thank you to all you brave um, conference goers who stuck it out to the bitter end. I'd like to start with a quote from Theodore Adorno. The unreality of games gives notice that reality is not yet real. Unconsciously, they rehearse the right life. This quotation from Theodore Adorno's Memoralia is, as the full title of the book suggests, a reflection on damaged life. Games, he said, provide a parallel in mimetic world that acts as a sort of window on utopia. What he refers to as the right life, free from debasement, inequality, and ignorance, can be imagined and, more importantly, performed through games. Playing games can provide a means for resisting dominant ideologies and reflecting on one's real existence in the world. I propose that games be read critically, not simply as expressions of culture or as products for consumption, but as objects through which we can think. In this way, games function much like artworks, as pieces of visual culture that allow us to explore different avenues of reflection. In order to expand the scope of game scholarship, I call on Adorno's aesthetic philosophy. In his book, Aesthetic Theory, Adorno proposes a number of ways that artwork can reveal truths about unfree society. My project, like Adorno's, is political. Through philosophical contemplation of the semblance character of works, individuals may come to realize how constrained and repressed life is in the contemporary world. Such reflective thought will, Adorno argues, ultimately promote positive social change. Much of Adorno's text centers on the ways that dissonance of various kinds can induce profound philosophical thought. Dissonance, as he says, is the truth about harmony. He believed that the note that did not fit, the color that clashed, the brushstroke that did not mesh with the whole, revealed more about life than perfect art objects could alone. In order to experience the philosophical force of art, or in my case, games, viewers and players must contemplate how ugliness, dissonance, and shock are representative of contemporary life. The game Fallout 3 is rife with a sort of chaos that can reveal the tyranny and decay of instrumental society. Of course, the mere inclusion of turmoil and brutality does not necessarily imply philosophical viability. There are plenty of violent games that do not easily lend themselves to reflection. What is striking about Fallout is its dialectical approach to dystopian violence. Moments of hectic performance are balanced with the profound sadness of desolate landscapes and destroyed lives. The player is constantly bombarded by moments of dissonance, for example, hearing a 1950s jazz standard while looking out over a demolished city. I argue that Adorno's concept of dissonance and philosophical reflection is correct, and further that Fallout 3 displays the kind of discord that promotes such reflection. I will attempt to illuminate what an Adornian game studies might look like using dissonance as a touchstone. Then I will describe how Fallout 3 fits such a picture. Now, Adorno is not primarily renowned for his love of popular culture, so it might seem strange that I look to him for a new path in game studies. It's true that writings such as On Jazz, the culture industry traffic of dialectic of enlightenment and on the fetish character of music and the regression of listening are scathing indictments of administered culture. Administered in this case refers to products that are created and disseminated by those at the top of hierarchical power structures. The primary job of administered culture is to affirm the status quo, to offer just enough beauty, escape, and succor to keep the masses content at least for a little while. Administered culture produces responses like how super, or aww, oh, instead of profound thought about the nature of life, truth, and utopia. Much of Adorno's work concerns how art objects can prevent the somnambulance that comes with contemporary life. Since video games often embody the most sinister aspects of administered culture, for example, initiation into corporate dredge work via games like WoW, um, in an Adornian aesthetic, players would use philosophy to prevent being crushed by the weight of received views. My example of uh, leather working that I spent far too many hours performing myself. His concepts can be applied to games as well as artworks, since, as I noted earlier, games can function as a way of envisioning possibilities for social transformation. I do not wish to debate whether games are art, nor do I claim that they may directly improve social consciousness. Instead, I argue that by using tools provided by Adornian aesthetic criticism, games can work as catalysts for social change. Foremost among these tools is dialectical thought. The dialectic, wherein two opposing ideas meet, challenge one another, and come away changed, is the driving force behind Adorno's philosophy. The dialectic is a kind of agonistic struggle, and agonism is one of Roger Calois' categories of playful engagement. 
Dialectical thought, then, is itself a kind of meaningful game. In particular, Adorno advocated what he referred to as negative dialectics, wherein, instead of focusing on synthesis or what fits at the end of the process, a thinker is interested in the non-identical, that which is not fit neatly, that which is missing. Focusing on the non-identical or dissonant goes against traditional modes of aesthetics, where integration and beauty are, review, are viewed as the highest good because of the harmony they provoke in man. Adorno was not particularly interested in harmony, but rather truth. Life, especially contemporary life, is decidedly unharmonious. Technologies and modes of labor fracture our consciousness and create false needs. Configurations of power and alienate individuals from their surroundings and from each other. To promote art as a balm for what ails us is pernicious under such circumstances, for it conceals the true nature of contemporary life and society. Games may offer resistance to dominating <laughs> schemas, but if they devolve into thoughtless fun, then they partake in the worst kind of archaizing or even fascistic behavior. Mimicry, after all, is an important part of most game structures. If one mimics in a careless or insensitive way, one is likely to perform destructive deeds and contribute to the adoption of negative behaviors. Playing games, I argue, must go beyond the mindless recital of creative activities. It can create an oppositional space that promotes critical thought and brings truths about contemporary life to the fore. It's this kind of play that Adorno says is the way to the right life. I argue, following Adorno, that a dissonance is a means by which individuals may be jolted out of the spell of mimicry. I include most kinds of immersion under this rubric, especially narrative immersion. For as Douglas and Hargadon note in their essay, The Pleasures of Immersion and Interaction, immersion and critical engagement are fierce rivals. The dialectic between the two is part of what makes Fallout 3 such an intriguing model. Yes. Player and spectator alike become engrossed in gameplay, eager for the resolution of both narrative and combat elements, um, but are jolted out of their reveries again and again, providing a starting point for reflective comparison. Fallout 3 is an FPS RPG hybrid, combining aspects of first-person shooters and role-playing games. And there's your stats in your pit boy. There's a heavy reliance on martial prowess, armament, and game tactics, as well as an avatar-based leveling system. Fallout also has a robust narrative, which players are free to undertake or disregard as they choose. Even if one decides to avoid the main plot, find Dad, defeat the Enclave, restore water, and hope to the DC wasteland, and there's Dad. There are a number of micro-narratives that function as moments of constructive or provocative dissonance. There are certain things we can very reasonably anticipate from a game set in dystopian wasteland. We might not know the whole story or understand all of the mechanics before we begin to play, but it's certainly no surprise when an irradiated scorpion or monstrous super mutant attacks us. Fitting with our expectations, some people will try to kill us and rob us in order to survive. Some will work to make the wasteland a better place. Good old Moira Brown. Such elements allow the player to believe in the world uh, and its stories and to then become immersed in the game. There are, however, other stories sprinkled throughout the wasteland that do not directly contribute to either plot elements or more ludic aspects of the game, but nonetheless add a level of affect that may deve be developed by a thoughtful player. If she is overly focused on the main narrative or on combat skills, the player might pass over these tiny yet significant vignettes. By invoking a sense of helplessness, pathos, and fear, as well as, sub as subverting expectations, certain vignettes and side quests construct a mood or disposition that prepares the subject for philosophical contemplation. Even if one logically knows that there must be stranded families or unconscionable acts taking place in the wasteland, when they actually turn up in the game, they separate the player from the flow state that she has achieved. In so doing, they open up her consciousness for a more analytical appraisal of the situation at hand, and hopefully, a critical comparison with contemporary life. A number of examples can be seen in the abandoned radio relay stations strewn across the wasteland. They do not any add anything specific to the plot, nor do they change gameplay, aside from allowing the player to access some usually very ordinary loot. However, if the player explores the area, she will find powerful, if loosely told, stories of loss and helplessness. In a game largely concerned with action and achievement, the player is forced into a helpless state that disrupts established patterns of play and gives her a moment for reflection. The case of Oscar Zulu is one of the most vivid. 
At this radio tower, the player can hear the following broadcast. If anyone can hear this, this is Bob Anderstein. My family and I have taken refuge in a drainage chamber not too far from a radio relay tower outside of DC. My boy is very sick, needs medical assistance. Please help if you can. We're listening for your response, 3950 kilohertz. The individual, as you can see in this image, um, who in recorded the message is long dead. Upon entering the drainage chamber, the player finds two huddled adult skeletons in the midst of blocks, a toy car, medical tubing, a crutch, and various other detritus. It appears that the youngest Anderson did not make it. His body is missing. Perhaps he was buried somewhere in the wasteland or became a feral ghoul. There are a number of feral ghouls that have teddy bears on their corpses, a possible clue to their origin. Instead of going on a quest to save him or to determine his whereabouts, the player is left helpless, unable to act, and unable to determine the truth. It is the absence of action, progress, and definitive knowledge that are noteworthy at Oscar Zulu. The vignette is worthless, insofar as worth is determined by points, plot, or success. Following Adorno, its worthlessness and lack of utility helped to make it a plenipotentiary of dialectical contemplation. It contains the power to stimulate thought through disparity, to provide a moment of desolate stillness within which the player might begin to reflect. It is certainly not for me to decide what the player would think about in her moment of helplessness. However, this scene lends itself to meditation on the futility of purposive action within damaged society, the theme that runs throughout the game. While Oscar Zulu works by means of dissonant helplessness, the wasteland also has instances of dissonance that provoke a more visceral, visceral reaction. In a raider fortress made from overturned railroad cars, the player finds a disturbing contraption made from barbed wire and grocery carts. Um, the raiders have constructed cages large enough only for children. One even holds a teddy bear. The player cannot help but be arrested by the image and to speculate as to the atrocities that took place in those cages. Similarly, in Springvale Elementary School, there is a, a cage that contains only child-sized skeletons. The cart cages and the child skeletons are not the goriest or most conspicuous examples of ghastly behavior, but they have the, ad have the added benefit of subtlety. Moments of horror can either interrupt regularly scheduled play or be accepted as customary. When repugnance and revulsion are supplied to the viewer in an unending stream, for example, in a game such as Manhunt 2, contemplation is not, not typically forthcoming. In games of this sort, where every action is, reord is rewarded with blood and uh, bloodshed and gore, individual choices ce cease to stand out, and carnage contributes to reactionary immersion rather than disturbing it. However, encountering trauma can be an entree to philosophical discovery. Adorno says, "There is no longer beauty or consolation except in the gaze falling on horror, withstanding it, and in unalleviated consciousness of negativity." holding fast to the possibility of what is better. Wishing that life were otherwise is the first step towards critical philosophy. Horrible things can act as a catalyst for such thought if they are not merely dismissed by the player as business as usual. The third and final example I wish to discuss is found in Vault 112. Inside the vault is a simulated neighborhood called Tranquility Lane, which seems to be a 1950s by a deranged doctor. Here's his avatar within the simulated 1950s um, neighborhood in order to manipulate the residents. In this area, perky television theme music plays on a constant loop. No one save old lady dithers is aware that the world is a simulation, and if the player suggests that Tranquility Lane is anything but the perfect neighborhood, residents become irritated. To quit the simulation, the player must put the residents out of their unbeknownst misery. She may kill them herself or set Chinese combatants loose in the neighborhood. Seeing soldiers mow down unsuspecting suburbanites is a startling contrast to the rollicking mid-century sitcom atmosphere. The player has no good choices in this situation. Everyone must die for her to succeed. The contrast between the perfect neighborhood and the violent demise of its inhabitants is no doubt alienating. However, as Adorno notes in regards to the technology of motor vehicles, which driver is not tempted merely by the power of his engine to wipe out the vermin of the street, pedestrians, children, and cyclists? What player does not in some way identify with the soldiers and their mission? Since she spends the majority of game killing things in a similar way, the player cannot ultimately escape the sensation that she both caused this mayhem and imitates it in the larger game world. 
regardless of how she might rationalize her behavior as necessary or ethically permissible. What is noteworthy about the soldiers is not that their behavior is peculiar, but rather that it is sim so similar to the player's own. The player may experience such a performance as dissonance or simply absurd humor, but nonetheless, the opening for reflection is there. What is common among all these examples is the arresting quality that jolt, jolts one from immersive, flowing gameplay and interjects unexpected emotional response. The dissonant moments do not automatically produce enlightenment. They merely provide an opportunity for reflection. In order to benefit from them philosophically, the player must be receptive to such incursions into her flow state. When a player uses dissonance moments in a text for contemplation, she begins to imagine the possibilities for living otherwise, visions of utopia. Often these visions come to us only negatively if work is so arresting or ugly that we begin to realize just how damaged contemporary life is, how far from utopia we truly are. Games, too, have such power. In them, as Adorno says, reality is not yet real. They provide visions of possible worlds that we might either work towards or against. If players are conscious of how the mimetic tendency manipulates them and actively work against it, they are better armed against being manipulated in games and the world at large. Paying attention to dissonant moments and to unsettling micro-narratives embedded in otherwise seamless gameplay is one way to reject thoughtless immersion in mimicry and begin to water the seeds of philosophy amidst the ashes. Thank you. I think that at times, being immersed in a game, you follow the whims of the, the game and what can be administered or instrumental culture in a way that, that might be, you know, negative, you know. So I think that um, having these moments of engagement where you have to step back and there's friction and there, you know, you're coming up against a wall for one reason or another um, will kind of help sort of break what might be a spell and what, you know, what might be manipulating you in a negative manner. No. Sorry? I would say that I'm, I'm very much not a Kantian in any respect oh, whatsoever. No. Let me explain a little bit what, what I think about this. Um, what I'm taking this idea from is um, Douglas and Hardon have this idea that uh, there are two different ways of interacting with the text. Two, these, they talk about two. And in one, you can accept the rules of the text and you can um, be engulfed by it and know about if there's a rule, why there's the rule? And they're saying on the opposite side of that, there's engagement, where it's not about playing within rules, it's about kind of understanding, you know, thinking about why there is a 
bracket or frame, et cetera. So I think that there are different ways of understanding immersion. The way that I'm looking at immersion is a kind of um, being accepting of a kind of the mimetic impulse and the moments of engagement are where you cease to accept the mimetic impulse. So there might be other ways of looking at immersion, certainly, but that's, this is my kind of understanding of it at the moment. Okay, so you're, you're in a game world and um, everything's going on hunky-dory, you're collecting everything you want, you're you know, having fun, that's you know, all well and good. You get to a moment where you have to, are forced to think about why you're having fun. You know, what, it's kind of a stepping outside of the frame. So for this moment, you're no longer inside the game. You're kind of in a, a space that's slightly outside of it. So, okay, well, I think we disagree on that point because I don't see it as being particularly Kantian. Kantian is um, very disinterested, and I think that that is a mistake that you've never kind of disinterested when you're interacting. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, but you know, I think that perhaps under my definition, it, it, it did. So for a while, you're going along and accepting the, the version of the world that's inside of the game, and then game starts only semi-autonomous, right? They are separated from the world only by a, a thin membrane. Once you bring these outside objects into your thought, you're, you're changing the game world. Because, I mean, this is, you know, 200 years in the future. Columbine didn't happen. And so obviously there's another, this is, they had a divergent history that started in the 1950s. So, so it, because this is not our world 200 years from now, right? This is a different world. And so what I think is that because you did bring in this moment, this Columbine thought, that is a, a form of critical engagement that by my definition breaks immersion. By your definition it might not, but that's... Okay. Well, then you were, you were more engaged, I think, by my definition. And obviously players experience, well, people's experience of the game is going to be different. Like I said, they might just like laugh something off or, you know, uh, just think it was funny that these combatants are killing these innocents. Um, so I think it is a very good point that people's understanding of their own playing is going to vary widely. And all I'm saying is that there are these moments when you can't mindlessly progress in a game and that you must think about why you're there. And so pretty much what I want players to do is to take a moment and think about why they're there to make sure that they're not getting played. So that's kind of it, and that's really, I think that you did that.
Yeah, I think. Also, they need to buy all these kind of discourse and game movements where you mm -hmm. say, okay, here, I try to break your expectations. And at a certain point, just like in modern theater, they might say, oh, yeah, you're video game breaking my expectations. Mm -hmm. Tell me aesthetically without being critically engaged. Yeah, I think that's an absolutely excellent point. Um, Adorno's aesthetic project didn't exactly turn out the way he wanted it to. You know, high modernism didn't do all of these things. And I think that the point is that we have to work really effing hard to get it done, right? So we have to continually reinforce the sort of will to philosophy or the impulse to philosophy or to reflection. And if that's not there, the game's not going to just magically bring it about. So what I'm interested in is kind of finding ways of having your average Joe or having normal people think about what they're doing. It's not going to happen automatically by any stretch of the imagination. And it could very easily fall into the trap of affirmative culture and be just like we're, you know, going to a play that no longer does anything for us. It's a constant struggle. So you're exactly right. Is this going to be an eternal rather than catch off game between what people are used to versus coming up with new ways of breaking these pathways? And also um, kind of allowing ourselves to be prepared to have moments like that, you know, even if they are minuscule, you know, it's a start. But that's a great point. As, yeah, I think that that's this kind of a poverty that we can't engage with, you know, kitsch objects or whatever. And I think perhaps um, I, both Ador early Adorno and some other um, works would say that they have no kind of true content. But I think that you're right in that there is a great deal about society to be learned or to be thought of by, you know, philosophizing fun. I just think that if it's kind of mindless fun, then um, we're not going to get anywhere with it. I'm not sure if that addresses your issue. Yeah, that's, or that's pretty much what it is. It just strikes me that it's still you know, seen as something that is not to be engaged with, for instance. Yeah, that's too, it's unfortunate. And I certainly don't have any magic way to change that, though I wish I did. But that's no, but if you say John Adorno, then that, that, that's the kind of trap you can apply in natural reading to his works. I mean, I'm not that. No, no, no. I think, I think you're right insofar as um, he, he actually has a much more nuanced view, especially in aesthetic theory, about the value of popular culture, kitsch, and resistance um, to you know, hegemonic structures that will tr be trying to manipulate people. Um, so I think that I don't want to either be an orthodox Adornian. I want to use these elements um, in order to kind of produce philosophical discussion, if that makes sense. <laughs>